My first memory of football as a child would probably be the posters that were on my bedroom wall. Um, as a young kid, I didn't take much of an interest in football. I was more into to music. But my brother was. We shared a bedroom in uh, Upper Gilmer Place where we lived. And I just remember his side of the wall being covered in Hibs posters, notably the, the 1972 League and Driver Cup win, the, the Evening News um, put out this poster uh, celebrating the, the win with paintings and, and pictures of all the players and, and Eddie Turnbull. So I kind of grew up with all these faces and I kind of, you know, I could have rattled off the likes of um, your Pat Stanton, your Brownleys, your Crockleys and kind of knew who they were, although I'd never ever seen them in action. But they're always talked about in the house between my dad and my brother. So that was probably my earliest introduction and recollection of, of, of football. The first time I actually saw it for real, other than, you know, playing at a park or whatever, was, uh, it, was it was one uh, night, I must have been, I think I must have been about seven or eight year old and uh, I was in the house and my brother was out playing and he was meant to come back because my dad was going to take him to a match but uh, John never came back and he stayed out late so my dad went right he says you're going to come to the match with me uh, no he says you're going to come out with me I'm thinking oh this is great me and my dad are going to go somewhere in my head I thought I was going to go and see the Tower in Inferno at the ABC and as it turned out we drove past the ABC and made our way uh, down to Easter Road and watched a reserve match between Hibs and Hearts. And I was in tears because I didn't want to go to the football. I wanted to go and see Tower Inferno. My brother was throwing a hissy fit back at the house because he wanted to go to the football and was getting kept in. Um, and I just remember being bored out my nut uh, when I first watched the game. It was a reserve match and it wasn't particularly exciting. Uh, and that's all I, I really sort of remember was the first time I saw a sort of real football game at Easter Road. And... It wasn't until many years later that I came back. I kind of missed the whole thing throughout the whole 80s. I was DJing and I was into my music way more than I was into football. I was into Scotland. I used to watch all the Scotland games. Um, I never really started coming to Easter Road properly until 1990, something like that. I don't remember the, the exact game. Um, I remember the circumstances around it. Um, I'd been invited to, to come to Easter Road because I'd started working at Radio 4 at that point. And they had uh, uh, they had passes for the Weir Toyota Lounge in the, in the main stand, which is kind of just down from where we are right now. And um, I remember thinking, well, I've never been to a game for years, but I thought, I tell you what, my dad would love that. And I'd been working away uh, in the borders for about two or three years up until that point. And I kind of saw it as a way of um, getting to spend time with my dad. Uh, because I was growing up, I'd, I'd moved out of the house, and I had other social interests, and I had my own flat. And I saw this as an opportunity to spend a bit of time with my dad on a Saturday afternoon. So I went, look, Dad, I says, look, I've got these passes. Let's go to them watch, just take you to the Easter Road uh, for the day. And literally, so, and that's, that's why I perhaps don't remember the first game, but I think it was by the second match here at Easter Road, I was completely hooked, and uh, I remember going, what have I missed out on? I can't believe that I've let this uh, pass me by for so long, and, and I was right into it, and we hadn't, you know, we'd only just survived at that point, the whole hands off Hibs thing, and, and, and being and gone and done, Hibs were safe, so Tom Farmer had arrived, and um, so, you know, the future was, was you know, we were in a bad place at that time, but, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the time when I started coming. Family connection with Hibs is uh, is long standing. As there's, uh, I mean, my granddad lived uh, in Bothwell Street, which is across the other side of the bridge as you come Easter Road, and he went to the school, which is there, uh, when it was a school back in the day. So he grew up literally uh, in the in the shadows of Easter Road, and then uh, when my dad came along, he did what his dad did and supported the Hibs, and that wasn't up for question. And then obviously when when we came along, then it was, it's, you know, it's the family way, the Stotts support the Hibs. Uh, and the funny thing was, my dad, although my granddad grew up here, um, literally a stone's throw from Easter Road, my dad grew up in Gorgie, in Dorai, in Downfield Place. So he was surrounded by Hearts fans. But because there was this family connection, Hibs was his team right from the very start. And, you know, you, you'll hear men of a certain generation talking about the, the old days of of going to Hibs and Hearts games with their pals and they would go to Tynecastle one week, the Hibs fans, with their, with, their, with their Hearts pals 
and then they'd go East Road the next week to watch it. And then they would do that en masse and as a group. And that's certainly what my dad did. And uh, he was probably a lone Hibs fan in a, in a sea of jambos. Um, but he remained true to that. And uh, and I think what that's also given us is, uh, uh, is you know, and I've got a lot of pals that are, that are Hearts fans as well. And uh, it's that relationship and that rivalry and that friendly banter that we all enjoy so much. And I've kind of grown up with that as well because a lot of my dad's pals, as I say, were, were Hearts fans. But dad is massive um, with regards to me supporting Hibs and coming Hibs. He's the reason I came in the first place. And he's the reason I still come because, you know, 27 years on from when I first came to Easter Road with my dad, we still come to the home games whenever I can. And um, so, yeah, I cannot imagine not doing, not doing, doing Hibs were not for my dad. Who is my favourite player? That's the million dollar question that you can ask any football fan, let alone any Hibs fan. Every every f fan will have their own favourites. You know, you could say the obvious, you know, like, you know, we've got Frank Sozzi there. I wasn't lucky enough to see Gordon Smith play, but I heard great things. Um, Frank is, is, a, is a, an obvious choice because he was such a classy player. Um, long before he arrived at Easter Road, he was he was uh, a fantastic uh, footballer. So we were so lucky to have him. Um, so Frank would be an obvious one. That whole era, you know, you could reel off a lot of the players in that that in that team. Um, Russell Latipe was just mm. amazing to watch, and John O'Neill. I loved I loved John O'Neill as, as as a player. But there's a couple that have always kind of stood out for me who perhaps don't get the plaudits in the in the the glory that the likes of Frank Sozzi and, and Latapi do. One that was uh, Kevin McAllister. And I just loved watching Kevin McAllister play and how he ran up that wing just for a tiny wee player and the things that he could do where on the ball. You were almost out of your seat every time uh, he went because you never knew what he was going to do with it. And it was, it was usually always good. Uh, and another one was David Murphy. Uh, David Murphy, for me, was just a classy footballer. Um, Any time the ball kind of came at him uh, at the back, he just felt calm because you knew, one, he wasn't going to give it away, and two, he was going to place it somewhere uh, to someone uh, that you weren't expecting. So, so yeah, there's many players that you could reel off and, and say, but for me, the two that I've always really been excited about watching over the years, uh, I would say, Crunchy, Ken McAllister and and David Murphy, both both classy players. There's plenty of players around now that that, that excite me and that I, I, I love watching. I think you know if you look at the our sort of back line, Darren McGregor, I love uh, him as a player for Hibs because of who he is. Um, what he is as a, as a as a Hibs supporter, his story I think is is almost Roy the Rover stuff, you know, working, you know, sort of labouring all the, the stuff that he was doing whilst playing football and then kind of came into the game late and then goes on to lift the Scottish Cup with Hibs. I mean, you know, you can't, you couldn't script that. Um, so I've got a great um, uh, affection for him, David Gray, for obvious reasons. Uh, he, you know, he will always be uh, a hero uh, for us. Um, but John McGinn, you know, again, an obvious choice, but John McGinn, Kind of reminds me of what Ken McAllister used to do, in so much that I love the fact that you, you know he's not predictable, and he's not predictable to watch. So what must he be like to play against? Uh, you know, you can only imagine. Um, but you kind of have the feeling if John McGinn's on the side, if John McGinn's on the ball, and if he's on his game, you know we're uh, we're in for a, a good ninety minutes. Um, Jason Cummins, I think, is um, a complete bam. But uh, I am absolutely thrilled we have him as our BAM, and I think he is uh, he's in the, he's in the right place um, because we love that we love, you know we, we love footballers with a bit of personality. We would never have I don't think you'd ever want to batter that out of him. And yeah, he'll do he'll do daft things, and uh, but yeah, he can he can create some magic out of nowhere, and some of his. Little quips when getting interviewed are, are are going down as in the stuff of legend. So uh, so J, J, uh, uh, Jason gives us a, a real spark of personality on and off the pitch, and uh, and that's a delight. And I think he's the longer we can keep a hold of him, the better. 
Um, got up in the morning and I, uh, you know, I was coming to work here because I was hosting the, the pre-match at Celtic Park for the for the Hibs fans. It was about 500 I was heading to the to Celtic Park for the for the hospitality. And uh, woke up. I'd even been I'd been at the Slater's and I'd bought a nice wee green jacket with a green waistcoat combo. So I was all dressed. I had all my gear looked out, but there was that feeling of oh god, you know, we're so close to this, you know, but you know it could be it could end in the way that has done for so much. So that was that was the photograph that I took of myself hmm. uh, first thing in the morning, about nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, it kind of sort of summed up. I was, oh God. But it was like, there was a belief that we could do it. And, and I, you know, we, uh, at Parkhead, we, we, at the hospitality, interviewed the likes of uh, Pat Stanton and, and uh, Alec Cropley was there and Stuart Lovell was there. But the difference to, compared to previous cup finals where we had chances to win it, I think the last couple, obviously, against Hearts, they were, you know, they were paying players that they couldn't really afford. It, was a, it, was a, it wasn't 11 playing field then. Celtic before that were a much stronger side. But we'd beaten Rangers, and we could beat Rangers. And um, there was a real sense of belief going into that game that, again, if we play as we have done in the past against them, we could win, and we did. And that's what was brilliant about winning the Scottish Cup, because we won it in such style. Nobody could ever question saying, ah, you had an easy draw or you had no, no disrespect. But when we, when, when we won the Skull Cup, it was against Dunfermline and people always liked to have a wee pop out. Ah, it was Dunfermline, though, you won against any of the big boys. Although we beat Rangers in the semi final there. But beating all the teams that we did, beating Hearts on the way, um, beating Dundee United on the way, and then uh, taking care of Rangers in such glorious style was, was it was just, again, the stuff of dreams. And. Um, it, it was it was just a magical day. You couldn't have you couldn't have asked for it to go any differently. But we were absolutely up for it and and thoroughly deserved the win. Uh, long those minutes after David Gray scored were quite long, and I remember the you know I was still coming down after the equaliser, and then we got the third goal. And, you know, instantly went absolutely bananas and hugging everyone. I had my dad on one side and I had Pat Stanton on the other. And again, you know, I'm going, I'm in dreamland here. I'm at the Scottish Cup final. Hibs have just scored a third goal. I've got Pat Stanton on one side. I'm with my dad. It's absolutely crazy. And I kind of went like that. I was like, my ha I'm like, I had my hands up and in my head going, oh my God. Oh my God. And I remember looking around and everyone was doing that. You know, there was a, a kind of, a real kind of, oh my God, we, we might have actually done this. We might have actually done it. And that's kind of, I don't really remember much about the game, uh, of, of what was happening on the, on the pitch at that point. But I remember that there was a shout, what looked like Rangers was going to get a foul, but it turned out we got it, which gave us, and it was, that was almost like scoring another goal because we knew it had bought us a, new, a few more seconds to, to wind down. But it was that, that was my kind of, memory of having scored the third goal you're going bananas you're crying but there's this feeling of oh my god you know and that was being echoed by men young and old uh, all around me and um, I'll never forget it just I mean again just elation and you know hugging everybody that was around me um, I got my phone out, and, I, and I, you know, in hindsight, I should have maybe taken more photographs than I did. But I got a couple of photographs because, you know, a few moments after the the final whistle went, and uh, I just looked at my dad. He was just sitting down. He was just sitting down on his own, with his head in his hands, and he was just having a wee, a wee, a wee moment to himself. And it gets me emotional now, even thinking about it. But I, I got my photo out, my camera out, and I took a couple of pictures of him because, like, he was obviously thinking of. You know, his dad, who lived and, lived and died and never seen it. And, you know, it was that moment of, oh my God, I saw, I saw what went to him and it was amazing. But isn't that, that's the great thing about the cup and, and that's, you know, what it meant, you know. And, and there's no shame in, in, in shedding a tear, you know. I, I'll still, um, you know, end up bubbling watching stuff on YouTube. And just when you see, it again, these clips that the fans have taken, 
and you know they're all doing that when the goal goes in it still gets me and 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 and, and I think that's what's brilliant about it because I will never I know that I can still get emotional we're you know nearly a year on uh, and it still gets me and I can still get that same feeling by watching oh in the documentary the, the DVD the, the the time for heroes that came out was just amazing you know and you got to live it all over again and you know, no matter, you know, we talked about Wood Hibs win the Scottish Cup ever again, you know. Well, if they do, brilliant. If they don't, c'est vie. We've had that day and we can relive that day. And I, 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 every time I tweet about the, the the Scottish Cup final or, or Hibs in the Scottish Cup, I always hashtag every day is the 21st of May. Because from now on, you know, football for me has changed. Football for Hibs fans has changed completely. And, you know, every day is the 21st of May because we can always take a wee moment to just remember how we felt when that final whistle went and um, and no one can take that away from us. Winning the Scottish Cup also impacted on the, the King's Panto this year. And I can remember, we were I was literally walking from Hamden to my bus uh, with all the Hibs fans all going crazy, all going bananas. And this one guy ran up to me and he went, Stoy, you're going to have to change the gags in the panto this year, aren't you? So we were literally half an hour after winning the Scottish Cup and seeing Hibs lift the Scottish Cup and someone mentioned the panto. Because for all these years, I've this has been the running gag that they've always taken the mickey out of me, you know, the 1902 and the Scottish Cup and la da da So it was, so I then had to think, yes, you know, we are going to change the the panto for once this year. And I thought the way that we do it is going to have to be quite uh, quite cute. You know, you don't want to be over the top, but be quite cute about it. And uh, so I had this idea, well, I'm going to have to bring on a Scottish Cup at some point. Obviously, we wouldn't be able to get the real thing. So we worked out this routine, and the punchline was me going off, singing I'm on my way from misery to happiness by the proclaimers, and I grab the Scottish Cup and have a wee moment for the Hibs fans. Uh, and... It was a tricky one explaining that to our producers in London and Scarborough and Alan Stewart and saying, look, you're going to have to trust me on this one. And they're like going, you know, Hibs, Scottish Cup, what are you talking about? What's, what's, because down there they don't quite grasp. So I'm saying, look, trust me, let me do this. Um, it'll go down a storm most nights. And uh, so we did it and, then, and it did. And it was got a great reaction. I come on and I had this sort of cardboard cut out of, of the Scottish Cup. And then... Uh, I'm speaking to the club and uh, they said, uh, look, do you, want to, do you want to have the cup, the actual cup, on on stage at the Kings? And I was like, are you kidding me? So I had to arrange the logistics of it because we needed somebody there to look after it. Um, and I said, look, I need it there for that moment. I'm going to take it across. We'll do this and do that. So we had to change, you know, the show effectively had to be tweaked slightly so that we, we knew this was happening. And uh, we got on Christmas Eve. So on Christmas Eve, the Scottish Cup on the second show uh, made its uh, appearance on stage. Now, the excitement, not just with the audience, because they didn't know what was happening, but the crew backstage, a lot of the, the crew at the, at Hib, at the King's Theatre are, are Hibs fans. So we had to arrange a photo opportunity um, before the show with all the crew, because they were going bananas. It was like, well, getting the Scottish Cup here. So we got the Scottish Cup uh, on Christmas Eve, and it was it was fantastic. It was a lovely, lovely you know, way to do, the, to do that show. And then it came back again in January. We got another uh, another hit with it in, in January. We did exactly the same again. And I basically said, you know, well, my cardboard cast is, this isn't the real thing. This is the real thing. And, uh, and I got to do the Proclaimers again. There was this, <laughs> it's like I was a wee bit late because obviously we had the Scottish Cup on the Saturday. And then on the Sunday, there was the, the parade and the party thereafter. And, you know, the party never really stopped from about five o'clock on the Saturday. And and I was a wee bit late for my show on the Monday morning. And uh, Boogie and Arlene and Marty had to kind of stay on and cover for me until I, until I got in. And uh, I think I managed to get on here about 20 past, 25 past 10, which is probably the latest I have ever, ever been in all 27 years of working Radio 4th, but given we'd just broken a 114-year duck, I think the bosses were all right with that. Oh, I, th I think it's it's absolutely vital. It's priceless because, you know, as much as 
we all love the club and we, a lot of us tend to live in the here and now and we we have memories, but there are our own memories of what we, we have seen and what games we have been to. But certainly since the Historical Trust uh, started and what I have learned about Hibs through either doing events for Historical Trust or speaking to Tommy or just reading about the stuff that's gone before online, even at the Hall of Fame dinner, you find out about these characters that, have, that played a massive part. Uh, Jimmy McCall, who dedicated 50 years service to this place, I had no idea uh, that people like, uh, like, like Jimmy had played such a big part. So it's it's hugely important, and I think it's you know it's if it's your football club, then you don't just love it for the here and now, but you love it for for what's been in the past. And I think it's very important that we you know we have a, a good knowledge of of the personalities, the people, the characters who built this club and 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 gave us it, you know, because they helped you know pass it on to us. And um, it's it's our job to keep all that alive. And I think. You know, the historical trust is uh, invaluable to Hibs. I think it does a very, very important job and long may it continue.